All right, so real quick before we start, I mean, don't get up now, but if you have homeworks that you want to submit here, just make sure you turn them in before you leave. I'm going to pass around graded copies of problem set one, so if you find one in here that looks like something you want, go ahead and take it. Wait. Regardless of the name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can't like that. <laughs> Doesn't make any difference to me. <laughs> okay, so a few little logistical things before we get into the excitement for the day. Obviously, you have a problem set that's due today. If you're not submitting it to me now and you're not going to awkwardly run into the next recitation to submit to Juno, then you need to make sure it's tuned in by whatever it says on Moodle. I think it's 11.55 this evening. So make sure it's submitted by 11.55 this evening. You need to upload it as a PDF. No pictures from your cell phone, please, even if you convert them to a PDF. You're going to upload it online. Find yourself a real scanner. There's plenty of them around here. Just deal with it. Questions on that? I have a question. Uh, we'll, yeah, just a minute. Okay. Um, so after you guys submit your homework assignment tonight, you're going to have one more problem set that I'll release this afternoon. It's essentially going to be due a week from Friday. So you'll have a week and two days to complete it. The goal being you get it in that Friday. That way we can release the answers for you over that weekend, which will give you some time to look at the answers for your midterm the following Tuesday. So your guys' first midterm, and only midterm, I think there's just one, is two weeks from yesterday. Um, and you'll have one more problem set between now and then. So people clear on the calendar? Okay, so midterm as far as what it covers, I mean, it's basically going to be everything that you've done thus far, meaning up through the problem set that will be this next problem set that will be due a week from Friday, plus the two programming assignments. If you felt comfortable with all of the questions on both those problem sets and you felt comfortable with the programming assignments, particularly the second one, then I think you'll be in good shape for the midterm. If you've had stuff you didn't understand on the problem sets, now would be a good time to go back and look at the answers. Uh, once they're released, we'll release these answers tomorrow. And make sure you can either figure that out or come to our office hours to figure it out. There'll be regular office hours this week and regular office hours next week. If there's a demand for it, we can maybe schedule an extra review session um, next Friday, either next Friday or the Monday right before the midterm. If that's something people are interested in, shoot me an email. If I feel like we've had critical mass of it's worth me standing in front of a group of people and taking questions, we'll go ahead and set it up. Uh, so I got that question in the last presentation too. I have no idea. Email Professor Hahn and ask him. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, so we're not going to spend more than a few seconds on it, partially because I haven't actually looked back closely at the homework, so I don't know how capable I am of answering your question. But if you have a question on the homework, go ahead. Well, I, I guess uh, for the re-entering code, I don't ask this on the Google, but I have more questions. Are we to write, it says what correction could you do in order to make it re-entering or write safe? Are we supposed to write two individual codes, one that would be re-entering, but not necessarily write safe? And another one would be Fred Safe and not necessarily answer. And are we allowed to use a signal block? Okay, good. <coughs> Can't answer those questions. Um, so you guys have the question that asks about reentrancy and thread safety and then asks you to fix it if either of those are so. Um, and it is ambiguous as to whether or not your fix should be reentrant and thread safe or whether you should have a reentrant fix and then separate from that have a thread safe fix. I think any of the above are fair game. If you can make a solution that's reentrant and thread safe, then you can solve it with one solution, right? If you can't, then you have to write two solutions, but just make sure you notate this one's reentrant but not thread safe, or this one's thread safe but not reentrant. It is possible to do all three. I mean, if you want to have all your bases covered, you make an example of each. Um, the solution to each is a little bit different. Uh, and as far as, so as far as using signal blockers to gain reentrancy, I wouldn't do that because you're making the assumption that the only way that that function is going to make call. I mean, there's too many assumptions there, right? You can, in fact, have code that needs to be reentrant independent of signal blockers and signal handlers and stuff like that. So, yes, that is the most common case, and often we deal with reentrancy by avoiding the issue, right? We're not really dealing with reentrancy by making a signal blocker. We're just saying, I don't want to deal with this. Let's make sure the problem never occurs in the first place. So it's kind of a cop-out. It is one we use a lot. Um, <laughs> you can make the same argument for using using mutexes for thread safety. It's kind of a cop-out, right? You're not actually making it fully thread safe. You're just ensuring that no two threads use it at the same time. So 
with thread safety, I think it's more justified because that's what's almost always done. But assuming that the only way your function is going to get called is via a signal block, a signal handler, and thus blocking signals will gain you reentrancy, you're building a lot of machinery around the question that isn't there. So if you're going to take that approach, you're going to at least have to explain it well. There is a solution that doesn't require you to do that. Um, it requires you to kind of reformat the way. I mean, it requires you to change what the function takes. But you can you can gain a reentrant and thread safe version that many, needs neither locks nor signal blockers. I mean, it's really kind of simple. You're you're avoid, you avoid the issue on the other side. You give it all your global variables and make everything local. Then you can have a reentrant and thread safe function. Did that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Any other? I had a question about uh, problem number five, where it talks about how you have four processes and three variables that are shared between the two uh, processes each. Um, it's just kind of confusing how, um, yeah, as far as I understand it, it's just the variables are being access, uh, synchron or there's synchronized access between the variables, but it's just hard to understand. So I haven't looked at that problem that closely. Uh, and it came up in the last presentation too. So, I, I mean, it's kind of, to some extent, it's a subset of like a dining philosophers type problem we'll talk about today a little bit. It says to use a monitor to solve it, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't looked at it that closely. Does anyone, I mean, don't like, I don't want someone to tell me their answer, but does anyone feel like they can briefly explain problem five in a way that makes it make sense? I think what's, what's unclear is, is how um, how those variables or what what is done to those variables I guess as those processes are called because it's not really explained. Uh, right. A, a number of the problems in this homework seminar are a little bit underdefined, right? Um, technically with the question you asked about, I mean, we can't really say if it's thread safe or not because we don't know how those variables I mean, you have to define what the expected behavior is to be able to tell whether or not you're going to break it. Um, I mentioned this to Professor Hahn, and, and we'll try to watch for it some more in the future. Uh, but some of these problems are underdefined. They kind of expect you to assume that anything that might be bad will be bad, when in fact, in some instances, there are certain things that you just don't care about. Uh, as far as how that relates to question five, I mean, if you need to make some assumptions, just go ahead and write them down, I would say. If you feel like you need to make assumptions, make those assumptions, state your assumptions, and then answer your problem and answer to the best of your ability kind of in that reduced context. <clears throat> All right? So I don't actually grade the homework, and I only look at them when people ask questions about them. So I don't have a better answer for you, nor can I guarantee that that will get you a full credit on this. With apologies, but that's the way I would approach it. All right. Anything else homework related? OK. So today we're going to find some chalk. Um, we're going to look at the dining philosophers problem briefly, because you've probably seen it a number of times by now. But we just want to use it as a jumping off point to talk a little about deadlock, kind of what deadlock means, how we define it. And then we're going to look at Banker's algorithm a little bit more, which you guys should have seen in class at least once now. But we'll work at Banker's algorithm example, because that's the kind of stuff that you have to on your next problem set and could very well it's a favorite for operating systems tests. Um, and then kind of talk about how these things get used in the real world or in actuality not. Okay? So let's start by just doing dining philosophers real quick. Uh, I imagine you're all familiar with this. If people feel like I'm going through it too quickly, please stop me. If you don't understand dining philosophers, now is the time to fix that. That'll kind of operate in the assumption that most people do. So in the dining philosophers problem, we have five philosophers <laughs> sat around a table where they're all trying to eat something like a bowl of spaghetti in the center. So each of my x's is a philosopher. Each philosopher, between each philosopher, exists one fork. So there's five forks, five philosophers. And in order for any philosopher to eat, they have to acquire both their left and right fork. Having one fork buys you nothing. Having both forks gives you the ability to eat. You have to design a solution to this problem that guarantees that all philosophers will be able to eat at some point in time. Uh, and will essentially, all philosophers will be able to continue eating forever. Uh, it's an infinite bowl of spaghetti in the center. You buy that with your frictionless surfaces and other such things. So, um, 
there's a number of solutions to this problem, but the initial kind of problem with this problem is that <coughs> it's very prone to deadlock. If you just throw all the philosophers in with no restrictions and say go to it, it's very easy to get in a situation where, say, every philosopher sits down and immediately grabs the fork to their left. Which leaves us in this nice predicament where each philosopher has one fork and no philosopher can eat. And philosophers don't put down their forks till they're done eating, so they all have one fork. They're both going to start it up because they can't eat, and you're never going to resolve the situation because until they can eat, they can never put down a fork, which is what's required for someone else to be able to eat. So you get into this circular dependency, which forces deadlock very quickly. So there's a number of solutions to this problem, as well as a number of reasons why this problem causes deadlock. We'll look at, we'll, we'll go through a couple of the solutions real quick. Um, everyone feel comfortable with what the issue is? So it might never deadlock. You could get lucky, right? This is the thing about deadlock. You could get lucky, and each philosopher could always just happen to grab forks in such an order that this could run for a million years and not deadlock. Deadlock is rarely guaranteed, but it becomes fairly likely over the course of time that eventually this will deadlock, unless we implement something that it won't. So the absence of deadlock does not mean your code is not deadlock, it cannot deadlock, which is really terrible. It makes it very difficult for us to know whether or not a code is going to deadlock, because even a set of unit tests might run fine for years before actually finding some deadlock condition. So we kind of have to deal with deadlock more in the theoretical realm. If you have to just understand it going into it, you have to write programs that are known to be safe. Because you can't rely on discovering deadlock through testing, since often it'll go unnoticed until, it, until it's not, right? And then you're in trouble. So does anyone know any of the textbook solutions to this problem and want to share it? Even in the odds. So what do you mean by that? Uh, odd philosophers eat first, and then even next to the trade-off. Okay, so you're requiring that we number our philosophers. Yeah. So if we number our philosophers, one, two, three, four, five, and you're saying our odd philosophers eat first, right? Sure, yeah. Or whatever. So philosopher five can grab his two forks, but we still have an issue. Well, do we have an issue? So philosopher five grabs his two forks, philosopher three grabs his two forks. One's an odd number, but one only has one fork available. Does this become a problem? So we're close. Um, you might actually be okay. I mean, if you modify this just to say all the odd philosophers have to eat before any even philosopher eats, then you, you don't necessarily have to have all them eat simultaneously, right? You can number them like this, say that you're randomly going to get either these two are going to be able to eat or these two are going to be able to eat. But when they're done eating, this guy's going to return his fork, so then your other odd one's going to be able to eat. And as long as you don't let the even ones go until that's occurred. So you still have a race condition. You're not going to be able to predict which one of these guys gets to eat first, but this will, I think, prevent deadlock. Oh, yeah, here's a, what about a prison modification? Uh, what if you started, you know, with, say, number one, and you just added two, and so you've got, you know, your first two that are, and you let them eat, and then, and then do a shit. So how are you going to coordinate this? So, so, yeah. so let's think about this a little bit in terms of how you would implement so if you're implementing this, each philosopher is kind of a threat, right? So we need solutions to which we can program each philosopher with the same set of rules, um, right? It's each one has to be loaded with the same set of rules, and then that's what they deal with. It's not like we're writing a custom program for each philosopher. In addition, an additional stipulation of this problem, at least as it's originally formulated, none of the philosophers can talk directly to each other. Um, so your solution is you essentially, uh, you go one philosopher, so you, you go with this philosopher and then two others, and then you skip two, and skip one. Then kind of shift it. So, so okay. So how would you? How might you coordinate that? that you're actually implementing this. And you might have to have outside uh, influence. <laughs> okay. So well, and that, that can be okay. Um, but so you're essentially imposing a rule that only two philosophers at, at max two philosophers are eating at once, and they can't be adjacent yeah. philosophers. Yeah. Um, Okay, so that works, uh, but you would have so you, you would implement that by doing something like you have to implement semaphores or something that yeah. philosophers had to check out before they could even start to eat, right? So before this philosopher goes to pick up any forks, he sees that he can get the eating semaphore. Maybe he can, maybe he can't, uh, and you guarantee that only two can eat. And then before he even tries to check out the semaphore, he has to be able to check whether or not his partners are eating, which depending on the formulation may violate the communicating with others rule. Um, but you could you could see a way to a solution with that. There's a couple of kind of very pretty solutions that are even easier to implement. 
This is totally defeating the point, but why not just add another fork? Because we're cheap. Okay. <laughs> Checking, because that would really solve that problem. Um, that was actually one of the things someone said in class. The other, yeah. the other solution being kill all the philosophers. So, <laughs> so, so you can add another fork, but then want to buy another philosopher, right? At some right, point, right. you're always going to have to. So, so let's deal with the problem. Let's not avoid the problem. Don't know which one. But. Isn't one of the solutions uh, number the resources and then for the philosophers that they have to pay the lower number first? And if they can't have access to the lower number resource, they have to let go of any of the resources they have? Good. Yes. This is Dijkstra's original solution, just the one you just stated. So Edward Dijkstra, famous computer scientist, did a lot of things, especially in operating systems. Uh, this was actually an exam question when he used to teach operating systems, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and his reference solution, that was his reference solution. So one solution says, well, don't number the philosophers, let's number the forks. So we number each fork, one, two, three, four, five, and then we program each philosopher with a rule that says, you have to pick up the lower number of the two forks next to you before you can pick up the higher number. So you require the order in which to pick up. You also say you have to return them in the reverse order. So you have to give back the higher fork before the lower fork. So what this basically imposes then is, so let's look at Sentinel Tower. Let's say everyone tries to go for the fork to their left. So this guy can grab the fork to his left. It's number one. He's not violating any rules. He sees one and two. One is the lower number. He can grab the fork to his left. So he grabs fork one. This guy, by the same argument, can grab fork two. This guy can grab fork three. This guy can grab fork four. But whereas before, this guy would have grabbed fork five and created deadlock, now doing so would violate the rule that he has to pick up the lower of his two forks, because one is lower than five. So that would prevent this guy from grabbing any forks. Then that would allow this guy, or that would allow this guy room to essentially pick up fork five that was then never grabbed by this one. He would then put back fork five, put back fork four, this guy would pick up fork four, and it essentially unwinds its way all the way back. Uh, in that solution, you often end up with just, I mean, in the worst case, you end up with more than, no more than one philosopher eating at a time, but all the philosophers will eventually eat. Uh, so that is the reference, yeah, that's, that's one solution. The slightly easier version of that solution is you just implement a semaphore that protects the group. So imagine like all the forks in a pool. And you implement a semaphore that protects all the forks and follows the rule that it will never check out a fork to a philosopher that does not already have a fork if four forks are already checked out. So it basically says it'll never check out that. So the rule for each philosopher then becomes you cannot check out your first fork until you can get a copy of that semaphore. And that semaphore is limited to four forks. And it essentially does the same thing. If everyone grabs one fork, the fifth guy won't be able to grab the last fork. That then opens it up to one of these guys, since they already have one fork, they don't have to worry about the sum of four, they can then go grab one more fork. So those tend to be your two easiest solutions, either the numbering with an order and reverse order, or the you just treat them as a common pool with a sum of four that you have to check out before you can take your first fork that's limited to four. The second solution kind of generalizes pretty well from yeah. other resources, right? Right, it's the n minus one solution. Um, it's, it's actually, it's in, it's an n minus y solution, where y is the number that each one needs to have, uh, is one minus the number each one needs to have. So since it needs two forks, which is y minus one, if you needed three forks, it would be y minus two, so on and so forth. Adjacency comes into it too, but yeah, there is, that is a, there you can generalize that solution. Um, again, in terms of which of these solutions are most efficient, you can fight about, there are other solutions. Uh, there are solutions that try to optimize and like, so neither of these solutions necessarily guarantees that each philosopher gets to eat the same amount, right? One philosopher, I mean, you would expect given enough time, they all have equal probabilities, which is probably good enough, but you could just, one guy could get really unlucky and never end up eating. Um, so it doesn't really address that side of the issue. That tends to be a little more complex, and we're not gonna talk too much about it. Sorry, just to be clear, you said that uh, the second solution is that the philosopher has to check out a sum of order that's allocated to two forks. So before the philosopher, if your philosopher has no fork, before you can grab his first fork, he has to check out the fork semaphore. Right. And the fork semaphore is limited to four, four people checking out at once. I see. So this guarantees that no more than four people will only hold one fork. To check out your second fork, you don't worry about the semaphore. Uh, because that ensures that there's always one fork left to check out. All right? So we're not going to worry so much about guaranteeing fairness between the philosophers. It's good enough that these solutions are probabilistically fair, right? given enough time, you would expect them to be the same. Sometimes probabilistically fair isn't good enough. You need to actually guarantee fairness, uh, in which case it's a little more complicated, but we won't worry about that here. What we will worry about is kind of use this as a jumping off point to talk about deadlock in general. So does anyone have any questions on 
the dining philosophy problem or the solutions we try to find. There, you get on Wikipedia, there are, I mean, there are way more solutions than you ever want to read papers about, but they're all out there if you want to research this. Um, so let's talk about deadlock in general. So the dining philosopher is an example where deadlock can occur. And essentially, when we kind of formally look at what deadlock is, there are always four common conditions that have to be present in order for deadlock to occur. If any one of these conditions is not present, deadlock is impossible. If all four conditions are present, deadlock is possible but not guaranteed, right? So it's necessary but not sufficient. Um, well, it's necessary and sufficient, but it's not guaranteed. So the first requirement in order for deadlock to occur is, uh, is essentially the requirement of limited resources. Uh, this is also sometimes seen in textbooks as mutual exclusion. So what this says is in order for deadlock to occur, we have to have some limit on our resources. In this case, it's, we only have five spoons, right? Obviously, if we can have an infinite number of spoons, there are no limit on our resources, and we have no deadlock problem. So the first requirement is there has to be some limit on your resources. Uh, it has to be a finite limit. The second requirement is you need a hold and wait situation occurring in your code, meaning that you need the ability to check out one resource, but then not be able to return that resource until something else happens, right? Your ability to check out a resource has to be unlimited, but your ability to return a resource needs to be dependent upon something. In this case, you can't return your one fork until you eat, and in order to eat, you need to get a second fork. So you need some kind of a condition that doesn't allow you to just return resources at will, Instead, that resource is going to be held by you until some other action occurs. It's a hold and wait. Third condition is you need no preemption. This one generally just gets kind of taken for granted because we don't work in very many preemptive resource systems today. What this would mean is, so by no preemption, it basically means that the operating system can't force you to give up all your resources. Modern day operating systems are non resource preemptive operating systems, right? It's not like you guys write a program and Unix can. I mean, the assumption is once you open that file, you're going to be able to keep it open. The operating system isn't going to step in and arbitrarily revoke your access to that file halfway through it. If it doesn't want you to open the file, it will do it before you even open it. Once you've opened it, you have it open until you close it. There is no concept of the operating system stepping in and kind of stripping all your resources from you. There are some systems that will do this that are preemptive resource based systems. Um, programming in them is very challenging because now your program has to be robust enough to recover from a situation where all of its open resources suddenly get stripped away from it without any forewarning. Uh, it has to be able to handle that gracefully and recover from it. And doing that's difficult, to say the least. So you don't tend to see this very often. I mean, this is almost all of our systems are this is true for. Um, but every now and then you run into saying that that's not true for. Obviously, this fixes our deadlock problem because if we can just tell all the philosophers or if we can just tell these philosophers they have to give back their forks, even though they haven't satisfied the requirement internally that they need to give back their forks, then we can solve the problem from that side. The fourth requirement is that you need a circular dependency. Without a circular dependency, all of these things might cause your program to be really slow, right? It could have to wait for a very long time for a certain set of conditions to occur. But if there's no circular dependency, eventually those conditions will occur, uh, assuming that everything, uh, assuming there is nothing else that gets broken. It's the circular dependency that will actually create a deadlock situation where everyone's waiting on someone else and that other person has what they need, but they're never going to get it because eventually that person's waiting back on them. There is some chain of dependencies, right? So in the dining philosophers we looked at at the beginning, it, it's pretty self-explanatory, but if everyone's holding the left fork, everyone's depending on the guy on his right to get back a fork, but no, no guy on the right can ever do it because he's waiting on the guy on his right. It's even drawn as a circle, so it's super obvious. Um, okay? So these are the four conditions that have to be present for deadlock to occur. Like I said, if any one of these conditions is missing, deadlock is not possible. Uh, so in the dining philosophers problem, we have all five, we have all of these. We have limited resources, there's only five forks. We have a hold and wait, you can't give up your first fork until you get the second fork. We have no preemption, there's no god figure standing in here that's forcing philosophers to give back forks at will, and we have a circular dependency because every philosopher is dependent upon the philosophers next to him to make sure they give back the forks in a timely manner. 
So the dying philosopher's problem is a problem in which deadlock can occur, even with all four of these presents. Like we said, we could be lucky. This could run forever and never deadlock. Because the four of these are present, deadlock is possible. And essentially, our solutions to avoiding deadlock involve getting rid of any one of these. Adding things like, um, adding things like, so adding like the numbered system effectively breaks our circular dependency because it ensures that you're never going to be depending upon the guy to your right since you have to pick them up in a specific order and ensures at least that last guy will never be doing it. So imposing that solution breaks the circular dependency problem. Having something like a semaphore breaks both the circular dependency and kind of you can also think about breaking the hold and wait problem, right? You're not going to be able to pick up that first fork if the system knows you're in a situation where you're going to have to wait because there's no second fork available. It just won't even let you pick up the first fork. That's why we limit you to four, right? So solutions to any deadlock problem involve finding a way to break one of these requirements. And sometimes you break more than one requirement. Um, adding a fork would basically be breaking a limited resources requirement, right? Um, so at the end of the day, if you can find a way to break one of these conditions, you've found a way to solve your deadlock problem. It's only when all four of these conditions exist simultaneously that deadlock is possible. All right? So like we said before, we can't, I, I mean, when we, when we deal with deadlock, we kind of have to deal with it from the formal side, right? You have to sit down when you're writing your program, think about these four things, and make sure that you're not allowing all of them to occur simultaneously. If you're not doing that, you have a program that could deadlock. Um, it's not like we can just run tests and expect to see which one of these we're violating. We have to think about it more at the design level to really deal with this issue. This is why deadlock is difficult. It's also why there's tons of deadlock bugs out there, right? This is a little bit unlike a lot of other programming we've done where our errors are immediately obvious. In this case, our errors are kind of theoretical, and we have to deal with them at a theoretical level. So in terms of detecting and avoiding deadlock, Let's spend a minute and talk about the Banker's algorithm. So you guys touched this in class yesterday, yes? Yesterday, Thursday, last week. Okay, good. Then you'll be really good at it, and I can make it go quickly. Um, so let's work a Banker's algorithm example. So essentially, the Banker's algorithm is a way to try to both detect deadlock and prevent deadlock. And it deals with recognizing whether or not the system is currently in a safe or unsafe state, right? where an unsafe state is a state in which deadlock could occur, when a safe state is a state in which deadlock is guaranteed to not occur. So what do we know with the banker's algorithm? Well, for the banker's algorithm, it normally starts out, we are given some number of resources, right? And we'll call them resources A, B, C, and D. So these are just arbitrarily declared resources. They can be whatever you want them to be. We're also told what the maximum number of each of these resources that the system has each time. So for our example, we'll say our maximum number is 6, 5, 7, and 6. So these are the max of each resource we have available on the system. We're also told that currently the system has three running processes. Process 1, process 2, and process 3. And we'll assume that we're looking at this problem where we're kind of coming into this at some point after these programs have been running for some time. So in the banker's algorithm, we have to know a couple of things about each process. We have to know what the max what the max number of resources each process can check out is. So A, B, C, and D. So these have to be pre-declared. And the rule is basically, when this process starts, it has to tell us its max, and then it's the process's job not to violate that, right? A process exceeding what is declared its max is, I mean, that's outside the realm of what the bank is all to deal with, or trusting the programs to be honest. Um, so let's say for the sake of this problem, process one declared its maximums as, 3, 3, 2, and 2, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 1, 3, 5, and 0. Because we're coming into this problem in the center, we also, each of these processes already has X number of each resource checked out. So we'll call this current. And again, let's look at our. So we'll say we're coming into this problem in a state where currently process one has one of A checked out, two of B checked out, two of C checked out, one of D, one, zero, three, and three, and one, two, one, and zero. So when you're given a banker's algorithm problem, you're generally, this is all the information that they really have to give you. Everything else can be derived. So the first thing we want to derive is, this is max. So we want to derive what's the currently available 
number of resources still in the system. So given this state at this instance, how many of resource A is still available to be checked out? Resource B? Resource C? And resource D? Everyone see how we get to that? So we're basically taking the system maxes and we're subtracting what's currently checked out. So we get to three because it's six minus one minus one minus one. Then we get to five minus two minus two, so on and so forth, right? So we've just summed up these vectors and subtracted them from the system totals. We also care about what's the maximum that, or what's the need of each process. Um, assuming that each process has to get to its max before it could exit, in the worst case, how many more of each resource does each process need? So we can set up what essentially becomes our need matrix. where the need matrix is just the difference between these two matrices, right? Between the max and between the current. So someone want to read me off some numbers? Two, one, zero, four. Two, one, zero, one, okay. Zero. All right, everyone see that? You take this matrix, you subtract this matrix, you get this matrix. All right? Good. So this is kind of everything we can formulate at the time being. And now you might get asked a series of questions, right? So the first question you tend to get asked is something like this is, well, is the system currently in a safe state? Where a safe state is defined as, can we generate an order in which these processes exit that will allow all processes to exit, right? So how do we go about trying to determine whether or not we're currently in a safe state? Take your current and you compare it to see if it can meet the needs of any process, and then you eliminate that process from the um, from the need category to allocate all that it currently has back to um, current. Right. Um, so essentially what we're looking at is two things to see when we're in the safe state. We're looking at what's currently available at the system level, and we're looking at what's currently needed. And we're operating under the assumption, this is the assumption that Maker's Alder makes, that before process one could exit, in the worst case, it's going to have to acquire its max number of resources. And in order to acquire its max number of resources, that's what, that's what we calculate its need, right? So before process one can exit, it needs to check out its need. So we're in a safe state if we can generate an order in which these complete, such that they can all complete. There might be more than one order we can generate. As long as there's at least one order we can generate, we're good. If there are no orders we can generate, then we're currently in an unsafe state, and deadlock might be possible. So let's start by that. Let's just start by, so can process one, assuming process two and process three don't do anything, can process one exit? Why? Because it's need and all of the elements Right. So if process one right now made a request for everything it needs to complete, it would be able to pull that request directly out and then exit. So we know that process one can exit. So the issue then is, okay, well, we, we, we just need this might, we might hit a point where we have to look at another order, but let's start with an order that starts with process one, because we know it can exit. So if process one goes and exits, then all of its resources are going to become reavailable, right? So after a process one exit, we essentially, our current's going to go up to six, four, three, and four, right? We're going to add it, its max is going to get given back to the system. It's current. Uh, right, its current's going to get given back to the system. Thank you. Um, so it's going to be four, Three, three, three. Okay? So now the question is, well, after process one exits, can process two or process three exit? Yes. No, yes. Two. two. Okay. <laughs> three can't yet, right? right? So our only option right now is, so process one exits, then process two exits. Okay? So let's assume that after the process two exit, it's going to give back its current. So uh, that means that this is going to become 5, 3, 6, 6, right? Yeah. Okay? Now we're down to one process. Uh, can process 3x? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we have enough available after process 2 exits. That process 3 could then exit. 
So are we in a safe state? Yeah. yeah. We've generated at least one order of exits that will allow everything to exit. So we are, know that we are in a known safe state. So that's kind of the boring side of things. Now the interesting side is we've established we're in our safe state. All that basically means is that this system isn't broken, right? Because you assume that if the banker's algorithm is working, everything they give you has to be in a safe state, because that's what the banker's algorithm guarantees. It never hurts to verify it. Um, so now the more interesting side of this is, okay, let's say we get a request. And we get a request from process two. Okay, so let's say we get a request from process three, and it wants one of resource C. So it's requesting, it essentially makes this request vector, right? It wants one copy of resource C. So now the question is, well, should we grant or deny this request? This is how the bank is item generally used. Where, if we can make this request and remain in a safe state, we will grant it. If making this request will put us into an unsafe state, we won't grant it. So we know we're currently in a safe state, so we have to determine if we'll still be in a safe state after we grant this request. So without granting this request, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna go ahead and assume the state as though we granted that request, right? So let's pretend like we granted that request. That's gonna change our current, because we're granting one resource C, right? So it's gonna change this to zero. It's gonna change this to two. And it's gonna change this to three. Okay, so we haven't actually told it we're gonna grant this request yet, but the banker's algorithm in the background is gonna do the calculations as if we had granted the request, okay? So now the question is, are we still in a safe state? Okay, prove it to me. Um, so P1 needs um, two of resource A, one of resource B, and one of resource C. And okay, so P1 can run the completion. Right. Okay, so let's assume that that happens. So we start with P1 running the completion. So just like last time, after P1 exits, these are gonna go up to four, three, two, and three, okay? And then also for P2, um, I mean, the only thing that would have been changed is resource C, which it needs zero of. Okay, so, so P2 is still fine. So after P2 exits, we're gonna end up with four, three, five, four. Should have five. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong graph. So, five, three, five, six, right? And does this give us enough resources for process three to complete? Yeah. It does. So process three could now complete. So we remain in a safe state if we grant this request. Thus we say, okay, let's go ahead and grant this request. We would grant it. We've already updated our tables. We can go on to the next request. If we had not been able to find an order like this, we would have to deny this request. Do you have a question? Are we also assuming P3 is bumping that off of its max? resources to complete. So the max never changes. This okay. table is static, right? But when we took that, I did update current and need, okay. right? Because are we current increased by one, need decreased by one. Okay. Um, we'll talk about max being static, but yeah, max can never change. In fact, changing max would completely ruin the entire algorithm. Um, okay, let's run another example. So let's restore this real quick to just like it was. So let's assume that that never happened. And now let's make another request. But this time, let's have process two request one unit of resource B. All right, so we make this request now, right? So someone want to take me through. So what's our first step? Assume it's granted. Okay, so if we're assuming this request is granted, what do I need to upgrade my current to? Three, zero, one, two. What do I update my current to here, or uh, here? One, one, three, three. Okay, and my need then? Uh, zero, one, zero, one. Okay, so <coughs> would granting this request leave us in a safe or unsafe state? It's unsafe. unsafe. Why? Because all processes need to be zero number. Okay, so this one's actually pretty easy to see, right? All processes need at least one of unit B, but we have none of unit B. So we will essentially, this is these are all waiting on something to happen that can never occur. Um, 
So this would put us into an unsafe state. The main Kazarian would, would then reject process two's request. So it's not going to let process two make this request. So it would reject it, it would roll everything back. So this would go back to a one. This would go back to a zero. And this would go back to a two. Um, so this was a request that would need to be rejected because satisfying it would leave us in an unsafe state, which violates the rules that they can talk So people are pretty clear on how that works? You should be very comfortable working examples like this. It's hopefully one of the easier kind of questions you see on the exam. If you understand the concept, it's just a matter of working it through. We got lucky. We could tell right away that this was going to be unsafe, right? You might get into cases where we could still satisfy, we could still give, we could still have program one finish, but then we might not be able to find a second chain on that command. So sometimes you have to go through more than you have to, you have to, again, you have to go further into that chain before you know whether or not it'll work. In this case, we know right away kind of makes life a little bit easier. All right? Okay, so be comfortable doing something like that. Before we get out of here, the last thing we'll talk about is, well, so the bankers algorithm is fine and dandy. Um, nobody uses it. And the question's why. It takes too long, probably. Nobody likes games in That's it. It's the Occupy Wall Street sentiment. Is that a helpful political decision? How would you be able to tell a priori what everyone's max requirements are? They have to declare them. That sounds like pain. I'd rather just have it, you know, kill my process and start over. All right, good. So there's a number of reasons the bank route them isn't actually used today. So this is another Dijkstra implementation. We have to thank for a lot of these things. He actually wrote this as, I'm on video now, right? So I'm gonna get it wrong. I'm pretty sure this is part of the thought. So there's an operating system called the that was a developmental operating a research operating system that and the banker's algorithm comes out of the work Dijkstra did on the the operating system. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you want to know about it and and this operating system actually enforced this paradigm. So whenever you launched a process, you had to declare the max of any resource. Now, as you mentioned, that is not a programming model that we operate in today. So problems with banker's algorithm. So problem number one is you have to be able to declare all of your resources you should a priority, right? You have to be able to declare it before you start. So it requires too much knowledge. <laughs> um, there's a number of situations where you as a programmer don't even know the resource you should talk about. You can't. Your most recent example is our, your most recent programming assignment is an example of that, right? You're not told going into it how many files you're going to be asked to process or how many names are going to be in each file. Those both affect essentially resource usage inside that program. You cannot predict that beforehand. Predicting that beforehand would require you to impose all kinds of extra limits that we don't necessarily want to do. Um, even when you can predict this beforehand, doing so becomes I mean, impalatable. It means internally you have to make sure that you're enforcing this, because if you slip up and actually request more than your max, you're going to destroy, I mean, the bankers of them is going to fail, and you'll bring down the rest of the system with you. So it requires too much knowledge. Other reasons why we don't use the bankers of them. Seems too sequential. Like, if you're waiting, if you grant out the number of resources and you find a safe path where it expects P1 to finish first, and P1 is like waiting on the same so getting the better output and you need to do a whole finish first. It still seems like you can. So it requires you, right, one of the tenets of the banker's algorithm is you have to be able to guarantee every process will exit in a finite amount of time. So you're right, anything that relies on user input starts to become a little bit questionable as to whether or not it'll exit in a finite amount of time. There's another issue there, which is even if process exits in a finite amount of time, we don't live in a world where we're willing to wait two weeks for our program to finish because that's how long it ends up having to wait on someone else to get into the right state, right? Um, so there's timing problems. There's also complexity problems. This, as you saw, it requires essentially a graph problem. It requires us generating these chains. And as you get a lot of processes, you could get way down that chain and have to back all the way out and try another chain before you find one that works, right? The search for a solution is has a huge complexity. It's, I mean, in the best case, it's n, but in the worst case, it'll turn to n squared, or, or worse. In operating system land, everything pretty much has to be constant time. Even things that are linear time aren't generally fast enough for an operating system. Uh, some things we can, we can get away with log in, 
Fada or with log, yeah, log in time, but it's pretty much constant time or log in, even linear is too slow, and anything slower than linear is certainly too slow. Um, this has another issue. What never changed about this stuff while we were working on it? The uh, building and the resource to begin with. Okay, the so the resources to begin with never change. Yeah. Obviously the max never changes. Yeah. There's something even more fundamental that we change Program all the time. What did you say? Process number. Like the number of which processes are processes. Right. Yeah. The banker's algorithm only works if you boot your system with three processes loaded, and those are the only three processes that are only ever going to exist on your system. You cannot dynamically add a process, which is something you do all the time. Dynamically adding the process is the same as dynamically changing these maxes. It completely screws up the algorithm. Because the algorithm is dependent upon knowing everything that occurred previously, you can't add a process in the center. It won't work. So not only does this require too much information, but it's too static. You can't change the number of processes. You can't change what resources are available. You can't change how much of each resource is available. A lot of these things we do like to be able to change. We like to be able to add, I mean, in the cloud world, you add everything, right? You add computers in the middle of an operation, let alone adding underlying hard disks, adding RAM, adding processors. All of these things we tend to do in real time now, and the bankers all of them cannot handle any of that. But the biggest issue is the processes. Even if you had to live with static resources, like maybe you can deal with that, but the way we do operating systems today, processes get on switched in and out all the time, and this does not handle that well at all. So we don't actually end up using the bankers algorithm in an operating system. Does anyone know what we do end up doing in operating systems? Or, or in modern operating systems for the most part. How do we prevent deadlock in Unix? Set up wasn't Texas. So how does the operating system prevent deadlock in, in, in Linux? It does them. It doesn't. This is an unsolved problem, right? The banker's algorithm doesn't work, and as it turns out, neither does anything else. So we live in a world where in most modern operating systems, preventing deadlock is the programmer's problem. If you write a program that will deadlock, the operating system is going to let you. It's not the operating system's job to prevent your program from deadlocking. Now, there are exceptions to this rule. Sometimes when you're using like life-critical uh, real-time operating systems and like medical devices and stuff, there will be requirements that you essentially have to implement an operating system that does stuff like this because we're not willing to trust the programmer to do it correctly. Um, and you know, if it's your heart monitor on the line, deadlock is not a good thing. Um, so there are situations where we do still use this, but general purpose operating systems, this is not well suited for. Occasionally, like very special purpose real-time operating systems, we can say, fine, it's only going to run one process. We're going to accept all of these limitations that we don't like in the general purpose rule, but we're willing to accept them here because it's a life critical system that only needs to do one thing, and we'd rather have to guarantee than have the flexibility of a general purpose operating system. But in modern general purpose operating systems, there is no deadlock detection and no deadlock prevention. It's pretty much all on the user. Because as it turns out, Deadlock detection and prevention is a very challenging thing to do. Uh, it's actually easier to detect, so Banker's algorithm does both detection and prevention, right? There are algorithms that are a little bit easier to run that will do detection, but then prevention becomes an issue. You could just kill the process that's deadlocking, but again, then the programmer has to be able to write their program such that it can recover from that kind of a forcible kill. There's, there's things you occasionally do, but the modern Linux, Unix paradox, or I don't know, Windows 2, Basically, it's, it's on you as the programmer to write programs that take this into account. The operating system itself won't deadlock. It's been programmed by people that have know what they're doing. Your programs also have to not deadlock because we assume you know what you're doing. Whether or not this is a good assumption, I mean, it's one of those things we still work on. But as of now, it's kind of an unsolved problem in operating systems. It's great to talk about this. You will sometimes use this if you need to formally prove your program. So like, you can look at it. You know you're going to have a set of threads running. You can essentially treat them as different processes. Within the context of your program, you could either implement a banker's algorithm or at least you could formally prove out a set of steps to kind of show that certain operations won't deadlock, but it's almost never done in general operating systems. All right? All right, thanks a lot, guys. Make sure you turn in your homework either tonight or right now.